Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right, check-ins. Um, I'm 5% nervous uh, and then 95% full of thumos because uh, James Kars is here at the STOA. Um, so welcome to the STOA. The STOA is a place for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the nice edge of this moment. And I'm Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the STOA. And for those of you who may be new to the STOA, maybe I'll just give a brief introduction to it because we have a lot of uh, new faces I see. Um, I'm viewing the STOA as uh, not a place to talk about Stoicism, but a place that's stewarded by a Stoic myself and for us to talk about what's most important during this meta crisis. And we have a um, few ty types of events. We have these sense making series and these kind of uh, uh, one off uh, events where people come in and share their thoughts and then we source the collective intelligence for questions. Uh, and then we have a wisdom gym that's forming right now where there's like an ecology of practices of different sessions to help us build our sovereignty and coherence during this uh, this meta crisis. Um, and today we have James Kars. Um, so this man probably needs no introduction amongst this audience, but uh, he's a professor emeritus of history and literature of religion at New York University. He's the author of numerous books, uh, one of them being The Religious Case Against Belief and ooh, Finite and Infinite Games. Legendary book, and he's a legend in this uh, wider sense-making space that uh, a lot of us belong to. So what's going to happen today is um, James is going to share his thoughts on how to play the infinite game during this crisis or meta-crisis that we find ourselves in. I will uh, follow up with a few questions about you know, his latest book that he's writing. And if you have any questions for James, pop them in the chat box. I will call on you, you unmute yourself, and then you ask your question. If you want me to read your question on your behalf, uh, I will do so. This will be recorded on YouTube, so just keep that in mind. And, um, or be recorded and posted on YouTube, I should say. Uh, what else should I say? Boop, 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 boop. Yeah, keep yourself uh, uh, off. Uh, like on mute, I should say. Uh, don't unmute yourself unless uh, you're, you're, you're gonna ask a question. So that being said, boom, James, how do we play the infinite game during uh, this meta crisis we find ourselves in? <laughs> not, not easily. <laughs> Let me start with that. Uh, you know, the, the crisis is uh, like nothing, of course, I've seen in my lifetime. But, you know, at the same time, and it, you know, it's, a ter it's a terrible crisis. There's, there, there's not an easy exit to this one. But uh, at the same time, it gives us, it's, it's, the crisis is almost tailor-made for a kind of re-examination of our own attitude toward the future, or thinking about what's, what's coming down ahead of us. I mean, right now, everyone is thinking uh, in, in, future, in terms that we could call future, all that is, that is to say, looking back at where we are now from some kind of imagined place out there, which may or may not be one, a place we want to go to. So, so it very, it's, it's a very good time to do some thinking about uh, some long range thinking. And uh, that's, that's what, I've, uh, what I've been doing. I've been thinking a lot about the way we engage each other in uh, all kinds of social relations. Uh, of course, the political, the, the whole political world is in turmoil. We, we have to do some very careful thinking about that. Uh, and so I can, I can discuss any of these issues with you, uh, anything that uh, is of uh, immediate importance to you or significance. Yeah, um, I have a few, but I'm, I wonder what's most alive for you when you when you're thinking about this current situation and. and well, what what, what I what's most alive for me is to th I, is to think that there's got to be um, we we have to make our way to a more civilized place. We're we're in a kind of civilization, but it's in it's also in crisis. And uh, so I'm, I'm looking for ways to, to uh, make ourselves more civilized. And so those are, those, that means addressing some very big issues. Uh, for example, uh, racial discrimination. That's one, of course, a very big one, very important. 
an, another one is the, the, the use of the environment, the use of our land. And in both cases, it's very painful because as Americans, as being the, uh, the, the nation we are, uh, we have not done a good job with either of those categories. In the first place, we're living on stolen land. This land really belongs to, uh, well, you know, it's a very, very funny thing. Uh, when America's Vespucci uh, came to the New World, he, what, he actually used the term New World. He came right after Columbus was here. Uh, and we, we have his, we borrowed his name, his first name, Amerigo, for the, the word American. But, but when he came, uh, he, was, he was not looking for a new world. He was trying to bring the old world with him. And what I would like to do is look forward uh, in a way that looks toward a new world, a lot of new categories and so on, a lot of new ways to approach things. I mean, even for something as simple as schooling or education in the large sense. I mean, I could talk about that at length, but... Um, but that that's now becomes very, very important. Most important for me now, even though a lot of the future is being thought about in technological terms or in mechanical terms and so on, I think what we need is an intellectual revolution, not so much a revolution of engineering or technology. We've got enough of that. So uh, I'm thinking in, in those, those categories. Uh, I have to double click on the intellectual revolution because that speaks to me and a lot of us here at the STOA. Uh, can you speak more on that? What do you mean by an intellectual revolution? Well, I, I mean rethinking what we do. I, now, I, I, I'm, as you, as you know from reading my book, I'm heavily influenced by the Greek philosophers. I'm also heavily influenced by the, uh, the, the, the Hebrew tradition, the, Jew, the Jewish tradition, especially uh, uh, the rabbinical uh, tradition. Those two combined uh, are, are fascinating in the following way, that once you get into a, a deep discussion, a self-examination, what the Greeks call dialectic and what the, the Jews call Talmud, the conversation itself begins to convert to community and uh, be becomes a kind of, of, it becomes a people. I mean, we saw this happen within, in the Jewish tradition uh, over the 2000 years since the, uh, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, they, they became a people uh, by, by way of conversation with each other. It's quite, a, quite remarkable. And so what I wanna do is get into that kind of deep conversation about the future deep enough that it creates community as, as well as intellectual clarity. And I know as a, you, you're leaning uh, toward Stoics, of course, uh, they've had a similar, uh, similar attitude. But, but basically, I, I consider myself, shall we say, a dialectical thinker. That is, I want to, I want to question where we are, uh, and look, look deeply into it, and then see where we can go from here. Yes, yes, that uh, resonates a lot. That's sort of like our, our, our jam here at the, the STOA. Mm -hmm. um, do you see any communities that are embodying this right now? Well, you know, I, I, I don't much. I'm, I, I'll tell you one thing I'm very disappointed in. Uh, the, uh, the, the, I'll give you a little history, just a little, little bit of history. So, so Plato uh, in... Uh, 400 years, uh, 400 BC, roughly, founded the academy. He bought a he bought a an, a, an olive grove, and decided to meet students there, and established an academy. Well, the academy lasted 70, 750 years, quite an extraordinary run, and there it began not only Stoicism but also all kinds of other movements. Uh, uh, different, different, uh, uh, you, you know, different varieties of Neoplatonism and Platonism, uh, Aristotelianism, and so on. And Aristotle himself had a school that lasted for uh, for a long time. But but and that school then became over time a model for the university. Now the university in the in the it was was really kind of conceived roughly in the 
in the platonic mode. That is to say, a group of people getting together, talking deeply with each other uh, over issues that should be of concern to the entire community. Well, uh, the, what hap what's happened over time is that the, the university, the, the, the modern university has become more and more expensive to operate. And therefore, uh, in a kind of quest for money, they've allowed themselves to be influenced by outside money uh, in, in some ways that, that actually, that, that money now is determining what we know, is choosing what research uh, scientists are, are you know, now they're, they're making up the knowledge we're going to have. Whereas for Plato in that, in that august classical tradition, you, you didn't have an idea ahead of what you're going to find. You, you went out on a free search to see what was there, uh, what, you could, what you could find. But, but this is not the case now in the modern university, and, and I'm very upset about it. Uh, I think that what's happened is that a lot of faculty have sold themselves to moneyed uh, supporters, and it's, uh, it's a kind of selling out of the university itself. Yeah. Um, so one thing we talk about here is like thinking in public and um, how difficult it is. Uh, so I'm curious, in order for this intellectual revolution to emerge, what do you think are the barriers that need to be removed? And what do you think are the conditions that need to be in place for it to happen? Well, I, th I think the first thing we do is open the university. Uh, right now, we're stuck in a kind of meritocratic uh, situation where people where universities are now selecting students because they can grade highly on certain tests and so on. And this, th this I mean, it's complicated to explain, but the uh, meritocracy has tended to create a kind of permanent uh, upper class, a financial, a financial class. And uh, it, it's, it's terrifically unfair. So I've been thinking about ways of of, of uh, counteracting the meritocracy in one way, just to give you a shocking idea of, of some of the stuff that's in my head, I would like to, to professionalize student, students, not give them scholarships, hire them to be students and, and break up universities into uh, intellectual centers rather than the four year march through uh, you know, the, the eight semester program, uh, which by the way, is completely arbitrary anyway. That was never part of the university system when it was founded back in the 12th century. So, so the, the uh, uh, what I would like to see is, is, is a whole new kind of approach to teaching uh, where we spend a lot of money on education. Now, now, people are going to say right away, well, that's, where do we get that money? Well, uh, by the way, we are spending over a trillion dollars every year, those Americans are, uh, uh, on uh, the military. And if we can pay that much to people to go to war, we can pay that much to people to go to school. So what, what, I'm, what I'm proposing is a really big shift in the way we think about our money, we think about our future, we think about our education, and we think about the coming crisis, which is actually, the, the, I mean, the, the, the current crisis is bad enough, but the coming crisis is the really bad one, the environmental crisis. So right. any, anyway, that's the way my thinking is going. That's, for, for example, that's one, one example of it. Yeah, I love it. Do you, do you have another example? Yeah, I would say one of the things we have to st start thinking about is an alternative to, auto, to the automobile. And if you, if you think about it, the automobile has now been available commercially for 150 years. And uh, about, um, an area, now I don't mean just automobiles, I mean the, the whole way of moving ourselves around, transporting ourselves, uh, it, it has been around, including airplanes beginning in 1903 with the first flight uh, in, uh, in Kitty Hawk. And, and then, uh, I mean, it's, ama it's amazing, Peter, in a way, when you think about it, to see how fast this technology has developed. In 1903, well, it, it, sort of in the middle of the 19th century, they began doing the, the uh, internal combustion engine. 
and, and began selling it commercially. And then 1903, 50 years later, basically, uh, we get off the, off the ground into the sky. And then only 66 years later, we get, a, we get people on the moon, which, you know, that's, that's really very rapid technology. Uh, but we have, to, we have to consider, we have to more, look more deeply into that. Because in the meantime, although the, the uh, internal combustion engine has gone far to make our planet habitable, it's also gone very far to make it uninhabitable. Uh, in fact, if we keep up uh, building cars and designing them the way we do, uh, we'll, we'll actually uh, in, in, end our race as, as, as such. I mean, it's, we, we are in a dire situation uh, looking, looking toward the end of the, of the century. I, I, I just see this, this kind of wall coming down at us. And we've got to start thinking creatively about it. And one of the ways is to re conceive uh, the automobile. Great. So um, I have a few questions and then we're going to pivot to the room. Sure. Uh, and the title of this talk is uh, Playing the Infinite Game During a Meta Crisis. And I don't know if you're familiar with that concept, but I think I described it to you somewhat in the, in the email. Is like there's an ecology of crises that we have, uh, like their racial discrimination, the environment, um, you name it. And, and like people are overwhelmed by, by all this and overwhelmed by what's happening. And, and there's like an uncertainty of what to do, of how they can be deployed to making the world a better place. Um, and so I guess the a broad question for you is, how do we infinite, infinitely play during this meta crisis? Is this for, uh, you're asking me, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, we, we, we begin by talking with each other a great deal about what our issues are, dreams, and so on. Uh, and we, we look at the ways in which we, we compete with each other. Uh, we, we look at the ways in which we, we spend money with each other uh, and so on. And nothing is, is really off limits uh, in, in these discussions. They can be psychological, they can be political, sociological, and so on. Uh, but, but we've got to do that. We've got to sit down and talk with each other. Uh, I mean, for example, uh, think about uh, the way we look at our vocations. A number, but most of us see, most of us pin our identity on the kind of employment or the job or the profession we have. Uh, I think that's a mistake. I think we ought to think of ourselves as thinkers primarily, and then engage and people who are engaged in our professions or vocations. And that that will mean for a lot of people, especially now in the current crisis, giving up uh, comfortable positions they hold, jobs that that, uh, that they're in now that may or may not pay, that probably pay pretty well. But, but may not, and th therefore think about living in a way that can extend that, that wealth out of ahead, of you, uh, ahead of yourself. I mean, that, that's, in a way that's abstract and vague, but, but I think when we, when, we, when we get together and talk about real issues, we, we can start doing that. I mean, we could start with, uh, with race, with distribution, with the, with the way cities are organized with the way we've, we've uh, developed suburbs, with the way uh, we have uh, taken the heart out of cities. We, I'm gonna look at the ways in which we create art. Uh, what, I mean, our, do we want museums to operate the way they do? Or do we want them, I mean, right now, a museum is a place where art ends up. I wanna see it as a place where art starts off. I wanna see museums convert to schools to training centers and so on, uh, among other things. I mean, that's what I want to see jails treated like schools, not like, uh, you know, not like, like four wall prisons, but put a jail in a, in a, in a campus and, and, have, and have really qualified, talented teachers uh, and so on. Uh, so on it goes. Right. And, and there's, there's uh a lot of thinkers, like I guess para-academic thinkers that are converging on what you just talked about, this idea that we need dialogue, like real dialogue or something yeah, called dialogos. Right. Um, and it, 
what what is that like again the conditions of the intellectual revolution needs to occur but what are the conditions of like genuine dialogue well the the first thing is uh we need someone you have to start i mean i'm, I'm again using the classical model and the way all di actually plato remember invented dialogue uh, and and invented what he called yeah i mean of course the, the greek word is dialectike dialect di uh, dialectic uh, and and what what he meant by it was uh, someone challenging one person challenging another uh, or beginning to ask what is it you know how well do you know it and here's what i think about what you know and then the other person answers and so on and they keep going on on this exchange and it's a kind of in, in a way, it's a challenge. In a way, it's a, it's a denial. It's a way of saying to each other, I don't think you're quite right about that. Uh, we want to look more deeply into it. But, but also, it's, it's a kind of discourse that has no end. I mean, if you read, for example, if you read the uh, Platonic dialogues, they never come out with a conclusion. And, and Aristotle himself, even though he took a lot of very famous views on different subjects, subjects he um, he always hesitated to come down and fixed on anything. And I think that too is a model, keep our minds open. Uh, uh, on, on, uh, I mean, I can go on about this, but. Um. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Um, so we're gonna turn our attention to the, uh, the chat in a moment. Uh, last question, uh, you got a book, your writing or is coming out. Can you speak a little bit more on that? Oh, yes. I've, I've written a book I call The Poetry of Money. The Poetry of Money. And what I mean by that, I'm taking, again, the word poetry from the, the classics, uh, poiesis. I actually wrote some about, uh, something about that in the games book. I wrote a little bit of a summary of, of what the Greeks meant by poiesis, which is poetry. They meant by it uh, the the creation of something absolutely new. They didn't they didn't mean only verse. I mean they meant that too. But but mainly it was uh, a, a kind of uh, someone engaged in creative work would start something and not know exactly where they're going to end, uh, to take off with uh, without any borders or limits or necessary requirements and so on, and see where it where it developed. They, they put this in opposition to what uh, they called techne, which, which we translate as craft or artisanship, uh, something like that. Uh, so techne, techne and poiesis are two different things altogether. And by, by, when, we, when we use a technique or techne with money, mainly what we're trying to do is make it is develop riches out of what I call riches. Whereas to do something creative with money is not only to uh, en enlarge the money, but to, to enlarge it in such a way that it creates possibilities out ahead of itself. The model would be Plato's Academy. He paid cash for it. He paid, uh, he paid uh, gold, gold coins, stamped gold coins, and bought this, uh, th th this olive grove. I'm sure it paid off a little, but that's not, he, he, the, the idea was not to make money from olives. The idea was to engage in discourse with people. And that was a payoff, that, that investment paid off like nothing else. Uh, 750 years with that heavy intellectual contribution really shaped the thinking of the entire Western world. I mean, an awesome contribution. So I'm thinking of, of trying to find ways of using money, spending money, that have that creative outcome. If we use money to, uh, to, to produce, to get more money, to, to add to our riches, uh, that, that actually doesn't work well in a society. It, it tends to create classes, it tends to uh, distort politics, and, and uh, does a lot of damage to the economy. So uh, I, I, I want to try a revision of our thinking about the way we use money. I dig it, man. I dig it. Um, so just before I ask a or call on someone from the chat to 
asked your question. Someone said cars for president 2020. Is that, is that a, <laughs> is that a possibility or <laughs> no? Okay. 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 Uh, so uh, I'm going to turn to the questions now. Um, when I call on you, unmute yourself unless you want me to read it on your behalf. Again, this is going to go on YouTube. Please be concise with uh, your question. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's do, uh, oh, and I won't, won't be able to read all the questions, obviously, and it won't be in the order. So just uh, FYI if I don't get to your question. So Moritz, you had a question. If you can unmute yourself. Yes. So my question is, how do you deal with groups that are playing finite games and that are not interested in playing infinite games? Oh, that's, that's not easy. No, I know. It's, it, but, but the one that you have to, uh, you have to find ways to talk to people. I mean, they actually, what they want you to do, when a group is, play, when a group is playing a finite game and, and wants to finish that game and so on, they're, they're very unlikely to ask anyone to join them. It's an exclusive operation. So what you want to do is, stay, is hang around them, stay with them, learn their language, and find ways of talking with them outside the game. Uh, now, when, when uh, some of the, uh, I had an experience when I was a kid, I'll, give, I'll go through it very quickly. We, uh, we played, we had a little, I was living in Chicago at the time, and we, there were a couple of vacant lots near us. We played a softball game there every day. Actually just played softball. The game went all day long. Come, people would come and go and so on. Every once in a while, a few brutes would come by and they'd want to break up the game. They want to win the game. You know, they want to get in there. But there was a guy who, who, was, who became a model for me in my, in my life, a little guy named John Fellingham. He was probably the smallest guy in that whole outfit uh, among my friends who, who, who started giving these intruders, these, these kind of br brutish guys, nicknames. Hey, champ, speed, uh, you know, he gave them all kinds of names like that. And then got them into the game by way of their, of their, of their label, their title, their, you know, their nickname. And, and they began to love it and so on because he found a way of getting into their discourse. And that's the only way you're going to do this. You're not going to, you're not going to settle it by winning their game. That will not impress them, not at all. They'll just want to play again, you know, fight again and so on. Uh, no, you have to find a way of, of talking with them that is part of their, their vernacular, part of their, their, their uh, dialectic within themselves, part of their, their rhetoric with each other. That's the best I can do on that one. Good luck. Great. Uh, Nicholas Benjamin, you had a question. Peter. Um, hi, James. Uh, thank you so much for, for writing this book, for doing all of that research. Um, it's one of my favorite books of all time, and I've recommended it to more people than I can count. Well, thank you. On that, on that, on that note, if, with perfect hindsight, given what you know about the world now, where we are now and where we're headed, if you could rewrite Finite and Infinite Games to have it published for the first time, which, on which topics would you put more of an emphasis and would you add topics? Well, I, I, one thing I didn't talk about at all in, in, the, in the games book is, is uh, money, uh, e you know, economics and so on. I talk, I, a lot of it has a kind of political cast. If you, if you think about it, one, one, of my, one of the points I want to make in the book, although it's a small, it may be a small point, it's a big point in my head. And that is, we should all be political, but not have a politics. That's what, that's what gets us in trouble. Having a very fixed idea of what our society should be, and then trying to go do that. That's a mistake. That's what, that was, that's what I, I learned uh, from, from years of reading Marx, too. Marx had a very specific idea about, about the way he wanted to go. And it was too specific. Uh, in the end, he foiled himself. He can't, fell into contradiction with himself. And one of the things I, I, would, I would like to do is, is to look more closely at, at uh, the way we spend money, the way we use our resources, uh, our finite resources, uh, and in, in a kind of material way. I didn't do that so much in the games book. I'm trying that now with a new book, but uh, at least that, that's, that's what I wish I had done. Probably one more thing. I wish I'd stressed the importance of evil a little bit more. 
because I think we we have in our sense, well, the 20th century, remember, we killed over 200 million people by government action. I mean, this, this is extraordinary. Uh, that's not, that's evil by anyone's definition. So we need, we need to re rethink some of that too. Yeah, thank you. Some, uh, some delicious questions today. Uh, Ariel, you have a you have a question. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, hi. You seem, uh, hello. Thank you so much for this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you seem um, pretty critical of our society's like intensely competitive culture. I yeah. was wondering if you see any role for competition in the intellectual revolution to come, and if so, what it might look like. Oh, oh. Thank you. That's a good question. Yes, I do. I I think we are inherently competitive. I think we're, we're born competitive. Actually, just let me give you a little bit of history on that. Uh, uh, James, uh, the, um, uh, uh, what's his name? The author of uh, Hobbes, author of the, the great book Leviathan that he wrote in the seven, near the end of the 17th century. Uh, well, Hobbes, Hobbes made the point that Thomas we Hobbes. are born, hello, uh-oh. Uh, yeah, it's okay. Uh, someone just yeah. went off mute. <laughs> oh, okay. oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Hobbes made the point that, am I still talking to? Yeah, Ariel, yeah. Ariel, yeah. yeah. Uh, Ariel, Hobbes made the point that we are born uh, competitive. And as soon as we come out of the womb, we're grabbing for things. So we want that stuff. We want that one, we want this one. And so he invented a, a, a figure called the Leviathan that that rules over society and keeps people from, from attacking each other, eating each other up, and so on. He's trying to prevent what he called the war of war again, the, the war of all wars, where you, we go into battle with each other and and uh, everyone loses. <clears throat> but but he had a point which I think is very important. Uh, competition comes with being human. So a lot of the things we desire. We desire them not because there's a shortage of them, but because we're competitive for them. And so I think one thing we do is look at, is, at the kinds of things we want out of our life and try to peg, peg that to our own natural competition. Do we want it because it will make us a little bit better, a little higher, a little farther out than someone else? Or do we want it because uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's my own desire, period? That's, that's a different way, a different level of consciousness. So uh, yeah, the, the, I think we remain competitive. That's fine. I, I, I like competition. Competition, you know, there, there are two things that happen when a baby is born. Either it's very, I mean, two, we're born with two kind of contrary instincts. The one is to be competitive in a warrior sense, and the other is to be competitive in a playful sense. And, uh, and I think the, 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 the warrior at times dominates and the player at times dominates. And so we want to remember that the player is interested in keeping the, con keeping the competition going, whereas the warrior wants to, wants to end it uh, in his or her favor. So, so look at yourself that way as that kind of a finite player. If it's something you want, if, if, if what you're doing is supporting, emphasizing, reinforcing the competitive character of human nature, then you're fine. If what you want to do is shut people up and make them do what you want them to do, not what they want to do, that's not so good. Cool. Uh, Anjan, you had a question. Uh, hey, thank, thanks, James. Uh, I'm going to read out my question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, what do you feel people most misunderstand, misconstrue about the concept of infinite and finite games? Um, and to ask a slight follow-up, what aspects of the framework do you think are overhyped? Uh, which aspects do you feel are underhyped? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah uh, I, I can answer that. The, a lot of people read the, the notion, a lot of people, when they first hear the, the term infinite, tend to think of something very large happening for them or to them. I, I've, I've been struck by the number of business people who've, 
who've written me uh, with interest about the, the, the infinite game. I think for some of them, they, they, they have a, a kind of fantasy of an infinite income, you know, of, of, of uh, multiplying their income many times. Uh, but that's not really what I have in mind. What I have in mind is a, is a consecutive, uh, is a series of engagements with each other in which a number of things happen. For, for one thing, it, it builds community uh, we, 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 once the, those who play together, stay together, to use a really corny term, but, but I think that's true. Uh, and, and so the, the kind of verbal dialogue we have with each other, the kind of uh, competition over anything we have with each other, as long as we are affirming our competitive spirit, uh, then we're, we're, uh, I think on our way to what I would call infinite play. But, uh, but it, the distortion comes when people think that they're going to be the recipient of something very large, very, you know, sort of very big infinite thing out there. Wealth, say, or riches. Uh, that's, that, I think, is, is one of the ways in which it's, it's distorted. Great. Uh, Dan Feldman, you had a question. Yes. Uh, James, I have a question for you. Um, how does reclaiming the commons relate to infinite games, if at all. Say a little more about that. We can't, we... Well, right now we have essentially the, the state and the no. market and the market, and it's basically a, a state that's been captured by the market. And in right. the last, okay. at least the last 50 years and probably the last, since the dawn of the industrial revolution, maybe back to, well, to I, John yeah, Locke, Adam's the enclosures right. and stuff, we got rid of, we yeah. got rid of the the commons since the no, charter I, of the I, forest I, and so on and so forth. Oh, oh, reclaiming the commons in that sense, yeah. Oh, I'm I uh, I'm very much for for that. The uh, I, I think what what happened is what's happened economically in the last uh, and politically, of course, at the same time in the last several centuries. I go back to Adam Smith on this one. Uh, Smith, uh, as you know, uh, had the idea of an invisible hand where the, the, the market operated on its own, by itself. It was a kind of a, it, 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 it's interesting. Smith wrote at the beginning of the mechanic of the uh, industrial age. And so therefore he had a, a mechanistic notion of the, uh, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the market. In fact, it was only a couple of years after he published uh, his, his great book, The Wealth of Nations, uh, when uh, this guy, this poor guy Ludd, tried to destroy a machine in, uh, in England. Uh, so, I mean, it, it came in that, in, in that kind of spirit. But that, that notion of a mechanism, of, of a market mechanism, still dominates today. So a, a lot of people think that the market is out there doing its thing, when as a matter of fact, we are deciding uh, what the market is. The, the market is not something that, doing it doing to us it's what we're doing to ourselves basically and so we've got we've got to take back the notion that the market is a function of our imagination not a function of, of uh, uh, not a function of money, money or politics or anything else because that too is a function of our imagination so so we have to do some very deep thinking about how we got here and how we're going to get out and i i i, I see ways of getting out i, I i'm working on i'm trying to articulate some of those myself in, a, in this book I've written. So thanks, thanks for that. I, I, I want that comments back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Manuel, you had a question about sexuality, I believe. If you can unmute yourself. I have unmuted. I have to find it. Um, <clears throat> I was hoping for some comments, please, on um, infinite sexuality in our current context. I believe the quote was that the only true revolution is um, the restoration of genius to sexuality. So I wonder how thoughts might flesh out in this time. Well, uh, for one thing, uh, the, the, the term genius I take very seriously. Uh, genius is not 
uh, is not necessarily an ability. It, it is it is working from the center of your of your consciousness of your of your life. So anything you do from your you know, an act of genius is a genuine act. I think that's probably the, the best way to, to look at it. So try to find that that's this is very hard to do. Try to find in yourself what you consider for yourself to be a genuine act. If you uh, if if you're um, if if it's out of your your personal center, which is unlike absolutely unlike anyone else's, can't be categorized, doesn't belong to any sort of type or sexual identity. It just it's you, you know, d deep down in. Once you find that and you you act from that act. It's, it's what I call original acting or, or ingenious acting, where we, where we, we, we move from, from ourselves outward. Now, but the world doesn't always like the way we move from ourselves outward. So, so conflicts develop. And that's, 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 I think, where most of the issues lie. It's not, not being honest with ourselves, but being honest with the world and taking what the world gives us in response, which is often negative, and critical and sometimes uh, hurtful, if not violent. So, so you, it, it becomes very delicate the farther out you get. You, the, the, the closer you are to yourself, the more expressive you can be. But the farther out, you have to be a little, a little more careful. Now, now not, I'm not telling you to stop. I'm just saying uh, prepare yourself to, to find not always a, a, a welcome audience out there. Uh, people who there are a lot of people who don't want you to be who you are uh, because it offends them in one way or another, and uh, so th that's something you've got to start with a recognition you have to start with. But start, but go there anyway. Love it, uh, Jessica Watson Miller. You had a question earlier. Yeah, um, I'm just wondering if you could speak a bit about. Um, uh, authoritarianism um, or finite gameness of, of authoritarianism mm -hmm. um, and maybe about how that relates to the current um, situation that we're in? Yeah, well, uh, what we see is uh, <laughs> people who want to be winners, uh, you know, <laughs> and uh, the, the uh, uh, it, it's interesting how if, you know, if you if you read history a little bit like I do, one of the one of the great um, conflicts you see all the way from the, from the time of the Greeks to the present, actually probably the same in in Asia, uh, is on the one hand you you have uh, powerful figures who want the world to be a certain way. Then you've got pe creative people under them or around them uh, at, who threaten them. Now it's it's a very strange thing to me that that a poet would be more dangerous to a tyrant than another army, and so if you look if you if you read uh, history carefully, you'll find that poets are often poets, journalists, writers, authors, uh, uh, creators, are, uh, all, all kinds of people are uh, often exiled, uh, and and they're very upsetting to the uh, to, to the rulers. So what we have now is an anti-poetic leadership, authoritarianism. There, and there are lots of ways to look at it, if you don't mind my being political a little bit here. Uh, number one, um, we, we see very little sense of humor in our leadership. Uh, number two, not any of them, not Trump, not Xi Jinping, not, not Bolsonaro in Brazil, not you know this one, that one, you know, and so on. Uh, not, not uh, anyway, not any of them are themselves artists or poets. They, they create nothing. They, they've given us nothing to live by, no quotes to live by and so on. So they are poetically starved. And I think that's what, um, de they're poetically deprived, depraved too, but, but mostly deprived. Uh, that's, that's my view of authoritarianism. Uh, it's, a, it's a dread of poetry. It's a dread of creativity. Um, and uh, and they're, they're, they are they mean business about it. Uh, Trump is terrified by free thinkers. 
cool. Does that answer anything? Yeah. yeah. Um, Jeff Loveland, you have a question. If you can unmute yourself, Jeff. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll find someone else. Uh, da, da, da. Susan, did you have a question? Yes, um, so it's an honor to, um, to be able to participate. Thank you for being here, Mr. Carson. Um, um, so I'm kind of wondering around the, what are the mental models that, that have got to shift um, to, you know, to move the dial um, you kind of alluded to winning, and I picked up on that win lose. Uh, but is there, you know, what what is it that is that is got to be that shift that you know we've got to get the um, the people to play to play the infinite game to make that attractive. Yeah, it's it's very hard to do, but but I think we can do it by uh, actually. Let me put it this way, Susan. I think we have to do it. I, I think if we don't, we're in very big trouble. Yeah. So, I mean, really big trouble. Uh, so, one of the things I, th I think we need is, is a kind of gather. We need people working with each other, talking with each other ab about problems. Uh, and uh, whatever those problems are, we begin, we begin re relatively small, but, but those, those conversations become can become quite large. Uh, I, 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 would, I would like to, uh, uh, I think, um, I, I'd like to find ways to, to encourage the creativity, the originality of, of people, uh, of, of freeing themselves from any kind of strict ideology. I mean, one of the things we have today that everyone's talking about is this very sharp division between the right, the left, the in, the out, the up and down, and so on, uh, the rich and the poor, uh, the black and the white. The, these, these conflicts are terrible. But I, th I think we have to uh, in, engage, uh, find ways of, of addressing all of them creatively. And, it's a, it's yeah, funny, I want to hang on to that for just a minute, because um, it, yeah, if I were to say, why, why would we want to talk about problems? Because problems are, are really finite. What, why are we, would you say that maybe the, the pathway would be to reframe the conversation about yeah. what we want no, to create? You, that's right. You start with the problem, but you transform it pretty quickly. That's, that's why I like the notion of, of speaking dialectically. That is, you, you get into a situation and say, wait a minute. Uh, if you if you follow like Plato's dialogues, Play, uh, Socrates was always able to change the subject in some way. <laughs> you know that is, you start off talking about uh, the justice, and then you suddenly you're talking about uh, you know. Uh, I mean, at one point um, in the uh, dialogue, the Theaetetus, uh, Socrates stops this young mathematician and says, uh, uh, "What kind of what do you what do you call knowledge?" And the guy gives them a lot of some examples. And the next thing you know, we're, we're talking about the nature of the state, the soul, knowledge, wisdom, and so on. They just went on in a very different direction. So we have to keep an open mind in our discussions. Stop trying to get people to think a certain way. Stop, as I said a little earlier, instead of be political, but don't have the politics in that, in that sense. Don't have a, try to be ideologically free. That's cool. that's my that's my best shot at that. Cool, cool. Uh, maybe Gray, you had a um, a question or question statement. statement. Yeah, I I've been really curious, especially um, with all of the sort of polarizing discourse around the meta crisis and the pandemic yeah. uh, about how you would relate that to what you talked about in the religious case against belief um, around how communitas. Uh, is something that comes out of the poeticism that is like so like rooted out by the structure of our political system right now. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, very good. Okay, yes, right. What we have, and I, I made the distinction. Uh, thank you for that. <laughs> I, I made the distinction in that book between communitas and civitas, if you remember that right. And, and civitas is a society thought of top, top down, whereas communitas is a society thinking about itself from the bottom up. So it, uh, a neighborhood is a communitas. Uh, the, the city government is a civitas and so on. But civitas involves a lot more. It, it involves a, a whole lot of social mores, of you know, accepted public behavior, uh, of, of unwritten laws, uh, and, and, uh, and so on. Whereas communitas doesn't have a fixed uh, content. It has a certain style, though, of originality and creativity. So uh, uh, the, 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 uh, you, you know, to pick up what I said a little bit earlier, of uh, what a lot of uh, political leaders are afraid of is the communitas. They're not, they're not afraid of another civitas as much as they are, a rival civitas as much as they are uh, the communitas underneath them. I mean, the worst thing you can do to a dictator is laugh at, at the dictator. And, and uh, you know, that, that, that's why uh, it is very interesting that Trump doesn't have a sense of humor. Uh, he can't laugh. He definitely can't laugh at himself, but also can't have anyone else laugh at him. Uh, he's very, very delicate about that. So, so great leaders are people who, who expect to be laughed at. Roosevelt said, the bankers are scorning me. Ha ha, I love it. <laughs> you know, so on. So, so we, 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 need, we need an attitude toward communitas like that. It can be very refreshing and very liberating and very reforming. Thanks for the question. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, Anton, you had a question above about money. If you would unmute yourself and ask that. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, yeah, thank you also to James for, for this. This is, so much of this is resonating. Um, I had a question, James, about um, about economics. You're talking about economics earlier. Yeah. You were talk, you talk, you yeah. talking about money. And um, my, my question was, um, do you think we can play infinite games with our current form of money? Um, or can we at least expand the nature of the games that we play with our current form of money? And or do we need do we need new form of new forms of money, new forms of economics in order to really create infinite games? How much can we do with our current form of money and economics? Yeah, well, I, I don't think we need a new form of money. I think we need a new attitude attitude toward money. Now, I I make a distinction. You know, it's 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 hard to carry this off, but I'm I'm making a distinction between being rich and being wealthy. Now, to be rich is to add to the amount of dollars you have, or whatever uh, your currency is, uh, and you that, that's something you can count. It belongs only to you. It's individual. Uh, and no one else has a legal right to it but you. Whereas uh, wealth, I take is a completely different thing. Uh, the I I, um, I want to go back to the word itself, wealth, wheel, meaning the well-being of a, of a situation or a, a country or a person or a, a community. And and uh, so one way of spending money is for the well-being of a, of a community. And, and, and one of the very most effective ways of doing that is, is education, spending money on schools. On, that's, th those are really great investments. Those investments pay off. Uh, whereas if, if you invest just to get richer, uh, uh, that really kind of shuts the money down, shuts the flow down, and uh, nothing really much comes of it. That's why if we, if we look at the, at the money classes of very rich people, we find very little going on that's original, creative, artistic, lovely, uh, and so on. I mean, I look at a museum uh, with, with big names on it as a kind of um, a testimony of those people that this is something they can't do. They, they, they're hiring artists uh, to... Uh, uh, sort of ennoble their name. Well, that's a, that's, that's a terrible use of money. Why don't they give that money to a school and, and develop artists or allow artists to grow out of it and so on? 
I, I think I think there are ways of of, u- of using money that are that are creative, hopeful, and will end in the community's well-being. Yeah, can I just add one thing? Um, my, my concern with money is basically that the medium of exchange is the message to yeah. do something to Marshall McLuhan there, um, and our whole society, our whole culture is built around the money system and it's created by the powers that be and so i just wonder if we can ever really play infinite games with it so i I think money creation is is such a central aspect to 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 whether we are in a finite or an infinite game Uh, right no i I, i'm all in favor of the kind of investment that will lead to investments rather than the kind of investment that will lead to someone's riches. And, and uh, th- what that usually means is uh, a communal expense, that is to say, a focus on the way communities are organized and what they're doing, uh, and, and, uh, and, and giving a, a lot of freedom uh, to different organizations and so on. Um, I mean, one of the, I, you, I don't know if you heard my rant about the university where Right now, wealth, uh, riches rather, are really controlling what what the universities are doing, and that's that's a that's a grave mistake. That's a very bad investment on society's part. They should be endowing universities, paying for scholarships for uh, all kinds of people. No, no, everybody. You know, even even uh, prisoners. I, I I want I want to be in schools of education of very various kinds. And all because all of that in the end pays off. It pays off in a way that investing in the in the uh, in what we call usually call the market uh, doesn't uh, doesn't pay off. That, I mean, I, I, this is a big a big question, a big subject, but that that's roughly the way I, I go on answering it. Great, uh, James. Do you have time for one more question? Sure. Uh, Joe, if uh, you had a question, if you're going to mute yourself. Sure. Greetings from Berlin. Uh, James, oh, uh, also, a good talk. <laughs> been a fan of your book for many years. I think I've probably bought 10 copies and given you. Okay, thank you. Um, my question, many people are pay- playing finite games either because they're in fairly desperate conditions or they imagine that they are in desperate conditions for various psychological reasons. Right. Um, what needs to happen for these people to start playing infinite games? Oh, that's 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 hard. I know I know exactly what you mean. I I mean I I grew up. I was a kind of uh, I mean I, well uh, I was very athletic when I was young. I actually it paid my way through college. I, I sort of regret to say, but it did. Uh, and and I and, and in fact, one of the reasons I wrote the book is that I, my experience being an athlete. A very competitive athlete was not pleasant. It was, it was there was something about it that I, I really didn't like, and um, it was it was full of all kinds of tensions and uh, psychological uh, uh, tricks and so on that that just didn't ring ring true to me. So it it took me a long time to sort of break out of that to free myself from that that very rigid conception of a finite game. Uh, and I think I think the only way to do it is not to it, it is not to come head to head with other finite players. Uh, I mean, you you don't want to be a finite player trying to end a fi- a finite game. You know, you 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 want somehow to pick up, as I said a little earlier, pick up their rhetoric, the way they think, the way they talk with each other, their vocabulary, their conceptual, the way they conceptualize things. And and uh, begin talking that way, but that's not easy. That's hard, and um, you sort of have to to come at it as maybe a companion or a, a, a co-player yourself, and so on. But uh, but it's the only way of going about it. A direct encounter won't work. It may work, but it probably won't. Any more? Any. Uh, are, are you hungry for for a couple more, uh, James? We can. Yeah, I could do a couple more. Okay, uh, we just got one um, from Akal. If you want to read your question, 
Yes, thank you, James. Um, Peter, sorry. Uh, so, as we know, in, in our democratic system, uh, you know, politician needs to win an election. Uh, they have finite terms, and the terms are, you know, short windows in the grand scheme yeah. of things. Um, how can we make sure that democratic system are played with players with an infinite uh, mindset? Oh, I don't, th I, th I think the only way to do it is uh, somewhat indirectly. That is to say, <clears throat> create a, a kind of uh, what I would, what I call in other uh, books, a humanitas, namely, or communitas rather, where, where we have a, a, a broad shared notion of what fair competition is. That's very, very hard to develop in a, in a large country like uh, Canada or the United States. But, but it, it is possible. You have to prepare the, in, in other words, the, the, the persons who need most to be corrected are not the politicians. They're the people who choose the politicians. So, so that's where you start. You start at the bottom with, uh, and you, you go to people you talk to people uh, in, in their language, their, their discourse, their, their dialogue, their, their dialectic and so on, and, and, um, and, and work, work up that way rather than, than try to pick out somebody who's going to do it for you from the top down. Uh, but those are movements very difficult to develop. We're seeing, we're seeing the beginnings of it right now in the, after the, uh, the, the COVID crisis. We're seeing in you know in the the racial issue right now in America especially uh, a beginning we see a movement beginning that's going to have I'm quite sure profound effect on the on the upper structure on the on the leadership structure of the society so we should we should look for that but that's where we go we go from the bottom up not the top down. Ooh. Abby, you had a question. Yeah. Hi, Jim. Um, my question is about, are there times where it's necessary to play the finite game within the infinite game? Sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Finite games are, can be wonderful, really. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, the, the thing, the, thing uh, the, the key, though, is what you're doing when you play the finite game. If, if, if you are truly putting yourself ahead of someone, you know, go back to the notion between the warrior and the, the, play, the player. The warrior wants to end the, the contest in his or her favor. Uh, and whereas the player wants to end the contest, but then is ready for another, you know, a, another level of play. Uh, and that, that's the important thing. As long as you, you don't want to uh, bring the thing to a definitive end, uh, then you're more on the side of an infinite player than you are a finite player. And there are a lot of finite games that are fun, that are fun to play. I mean, I think even a, a profession or a, a sports event or something like that uh, can qualify as a perfectly legitimate, uh, wonderful, in fact, even uh, sort of beneficial finite game. Great. Um, Jeff Loveland, I think you're back, uh, if you can ask your question. Yes, thanks, Peter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kars. Uh, how do we cultivate discernment in identifying people who talk the infinite game talk, but don't walk the infinite game walk? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, that's not that's, that's so easy. I, I can be fooled <laughs> by, by it. Uh, but but in, in the end, they show themselves. Uh, so m most of the people I know uh, I mean, a lot of the people I know don't want to lose anything. You know, they they want always to be some on the winning side and so on. Um, and I, I I don't know. I have a lot of examples in my life of people who um, you know will well. Just to take a really simple example, I I, I played a lot of squash in my younger years. Uh, obviously, not for a while. But uh, but I, I remember being really brutal on the on the court, you know, 
uh, hitting that ball like, you know, just like I, I wanted to kill the ball and my opponent. And then going out for a, a, a cafe latte, you know, afterwards and so on, laughing and even forgetting who won the game. But it was great fun playing it. Uh, but 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 it's tricky at the beginning. You you're not you can't you 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 have to you have to make a judgment. Some people don't want to. Some people just want to win. I mean, there are, there are people in that. Uh, this was when I was still uh, teaching at NYU. We had a big kind of a bunch of squash courts, and there was a crowd that played. Uh, and there were, there were people in that crowd who really didn't want to lose, and and you you had to avoid them. I mean, they were. Uh, they were not, they were really not fun to play with and not particularly good to play with either. And even when I beat them, I was not satisfied, <laughs> but usually I lost. Anyway, uh, thanks for the question. So here's a question. Uh, maybe this will be the, the question we end off with. I don't know if um, there's any more will come in, uh, but here is one that I was asked to read. Okay. Do you have any suggestions for regular daily religious mindfulness practices? Can you discuss any daily practice that you have? Um, I don't, I don't have, uh, I don't have a, uh, what we, what you could call a discipline, you know, a, a yoga or a, 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 any sort of a chanting or liturgical activity and so on. But I do have, I try to maintain an attitude of always looking for where the mystery is, no matter what the issue is. What is mysterious about this particular, even a very plain event? You, you want to look at it and say, no, wait a minute, that doesn't explain everything. There's something going on here I don't get. What could that possibly be? And then kind of focus on that. Um, and that's... Um, that would be my, my, the simplest answer I have to that. And that, but that comes after years and years and years of, uh, of, of reading a lot of religious texts, um, having a lot of exposure to different kinds of religious disciplines, uh, and never quite being taken up by any of them. But, but having an attitude of, uh, well, you know, maybe for all of them. Right. So maybe I'll close off with a question. Um, when we last chat, when you came on the podcast, we talked about this, this term, the metagame, that a lot of people, like everyone geeks out about meta nowadays, right? It's like the word that people love to use. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the idea of the metagame, like there's an ecology of games, a finite, infinite games, and then being able to go above them and have a look at them and then, you know, figure out which one to play from that. Uh, do you find that a useful comment, uh, co concept? Do you find it redundant? Like, what's your thoughts on this, this thing of a metagame? Yeah, I, I, I find it useful. You, you have to be careful, but I, th I would say, sure. Uh, you don't want to come to uh, the kind of... I think it's always helpful to step back, step up, look down at what, you, what you've been doing, look around, uh, kind of withdraw for a while, and take that reflective attitude. Um, or give, that, give everything you're doing a kind of reflective attitude. Um, I, yeah, I, I, th I think um, I'm more in favor of it. I, I would, as a, as a mechanical kind of process, I probably uh, would probably be a little skeptical about it. Cool. Um, so before we close out, do you have any kind of final thoughts for us, uh, James? No, but, but I do. Well, I do in a way, and that is make sure. We, I want to make sure we all use this terrific crisis as a, not as, as a way of looking forward beyond it, not just at the crisis itself or its solution. Uh, try to keep in mind the fact that this is going to be terrible, but something worse is coming. I think the, uh, the environmental issues sort of racing at us from the other end of the century are really dire. I, I, uh, I'm quite, quite impressed with how serious they are. So I want to say, remember, this is a terrific problem, terrific crisis, but there's a bigger one coming. Prepare for it. Mm -hmm. That's a good note to leave on. Um, so uh, I'll make some closing announcements and maybe you can hang on just for a couple more minutes to kind of hear what we're doing here at the STOA. James, fine, I think you'd quite like it. Uh, 
Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for coming on, my friend. Uh, we would love to have you back. Um, another jam session like this or whatever you like, really. Sure. Uh, so at the, at the, James, at the store, we have something called the Wisdom Gym, where we have sort of an ecology of practices where we're playing the infinite game together. Uh, we have a lot of facilitators in the, the room right now. So I'll call on a few of them and maybe you can just kind of uh, talk about what you have coming up. Um, Travis, man, are you still in the room? Uh, I you, am here, yeah. Peter. Yeah. So uh, actually, you talked about this a little bit, James, uh, today, but I have a, an event in the Wisdom Gym called Breaking the Frame, and it's every Wednesday, so tonight at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. And in this, we do a relational practice where we actually examine our own uh, relationship with our worldviews and the ways that those have changed throughout time and use the mechanisms that uh, led to changes in worldviews as a jumping off point for maybe creating some cognitive flexibility around the way that we view the world right now. Mm -hmm. So I posted the uh, link for the registration in the chat. I hope to see some of you there. Great. Uh, and Jessica, you have a relational exegesis event, uh, and you also have a, a book club uh, for the Infinite Finite Game, if you can mention that. Yeah, so I run a kind of book club uh, where you do not have to have read the book beforehand. We read collaboratively and we have comments kind of a little bit like people have been doing in this uh, Zoom in this interview. Uh, so the drop in every week is called Relational Exegesis. It's tomorrow at uh, 4 p.m. Uh, EST or 1 p.m. PST, and we're doing James Baldwin's Stranger in the Village. Um, we're also start, I'm also starting a book club on Fun and Infinite Games, which is of the same genre. So we're doing one uh, section every week. Um, I've posted a link to getting more information about that in the chat, um, and I will post that link again. Uh, but if you're interested and you're confused, just DM me. My name's Freya on Zoom. Great. Uh, and AJ Bond, you got a shame boot camp breakthrough uh, tomorrow, uh, if you can speak on that for a bit. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Thursdays at 6 p.m. we do what we call Shame Breakthrough Boot Camp, which is a very interactive session where we try to get in touch with and feel into a little bit of our shame and then discuss some of the theory around how to work with it. And um, it's really, it's a bit intense, it's a bit vulnerable, but it's, it's really fun. Yeah, and we'll do two, two more coming up that we're experimenting with. Uh, Ariel, could you talk about the, the dangerous space? that uh, we have this, this weekend? Yeah, sure. Uh, this Saturday at uh, noon Eastern time, me and Peter are experimenting with a new concept called the dangerous space. It's kind of like a contrast to the safe space idea. So the idea is we're gonna like talk about a, a specific political current issue like uh, race or trans politics, like something that's controversial. And we're gonna, we're gonna try to talk about it in a way where we foster like understanding and integration instead of debate and ideological dominance. Great. I am looking forward to, to that. And then I'm going to put my boy Nicholas on the spot. He has something called concept unfolding. Uh, it's, it's very uh, juicy. If you can unmute yourself, Nick. Thank you, Peter, for putting me on the spot once again. Um, we actually haven't set a date for the second concept unfolding. What it is is a way of um, developing concepts from seed concepts by running them through a lens and then expanding the limits of your language to understand the world better. So join me whenever Peter decides that I'm worthy of giving a Wisdom Gym talk and uh, I'll, I'll be happy to play the game with you. Yes, and for the record, I think you're very worthy of that, my friend. Um, so that being said, check out the, the website, thestoa.ca. There's many events uh, coming up. Um, and the Stoa is based off a gift economy. Uh, we view this as a gift for all of us to freely use in this time of need. If you're inspired to provide a gift to the Stoa or any of our facilitators directly, you can do so uh, at thestoa.ca slash gift. And if you want to continue this conversation, I would recommend going to the game uh, Be Coffee House. It's another Zoom link. You can just go there uh, and you can jam some more. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming out today. James, do you want to stay, uh, stay on?